Hello, I'm Susan Williams. I'm the Library and Archivist at the Highlander Center. We're really excited this morning to be able to share the story of Zilphia Horton, who was an amazing Highlander culture worker in the first several decades of Highlander's work. We're happy to have Kim Rule with us, and we'll say a little more about her later. Just a little introduction. So Highlander has been around since 1932. It's been a gathering place for social justice workers, and it's worked with people around civil rights, labor, justice on many fronts. Zilpia Horton was an anchor at Highlander, came in the 30s, really, I think, laid the base for the cultural program. Um, but we wanted to let you know we're still here. We're in New Market, Tennessee now, and this is our center, and this is a slide of continuing cultural work. This was women labor union folks who wrote a song and sang it at a workshop at Highlander. So uh, we're really excited about helping to share stories from the history that helped ground us in what we're doing now. Um, just to introduce Kim, Kim is a writer, editor, and folk music advocate based in Asheville, North Carolina. She spent nine years doing research about Zilphia, crossing the, crisscrossing the country, and is uh, just an amazing source and has written a book that will be available in a year from the University of Tennessee Press called a Sing Zilphia Horton, A Singing Army, The Life and Times of Zilphia Horton. Mm -hmm. A singing University army. of Texas. University of Texas. What did I say, Tennessee? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, you know, same colors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me start that over. <laughs> so Kim is a, a researcher, writer, and music, folk music advocate. She was editor of No Depression, which was a Roots music journal from 2008 to 2017. Um, she's written a book about Zilphia called The Singing Army, The Life and Times of Zilphia Horton, and it will be coming from the University of T Texas Press in about a year. So we're really excited to be able to have this conversation with Kim. And uh, so we'll just kick it off and start. Welcome, Kim, and uh, happy to have you here. So our first question is, who was Zilphia, and what did she have to do with Highlander? She was uh, from Northwest Arkansas. She was the daughter of a teacher and a coal miner. And uh, she was college educated. She was an award-winning classical pianist. Um, and she uh, had a falling out with her father um, when she was 24, he kind of kicked her out of the house for smoking. There's a much, much more exciting story around it that's completely false. Um, but he kicked her out for smoking and, and uh, she wound up uh, living with Claude Williams, who was a radical Presbyterian minister, labor organizer. And, uh, and Claude was friends with Miles and connected her with, with Highlander. And so she arrived at Highlander in February of 1935, having never organized anything in her life. <laughs> um, but she brought her music education. She had a little experience as a teacher. And she had this really warm, calm, entertaining personality that just sort of uh, enveloped people. Um, and she and Miles hit it off so well, they, they fell in love with each other they were just nuts about each other um and they got married three weeks after she arrived at highlander uh which seems like maybe it was a romantic whirlwind but it was uh i don't know that miles ever did anything in a romantic whirlwind um <laughs> it was much more you know i mean they were nuts about each other but it was much more about this sort of deliberate determination to forge an equal partnership um that would bring Miles's vision for Highlander into fruition because he he understood that the culture piece was going to be really important. He just didn't know how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Zilphia did, and he kind of sensed that from the beginning, and so did she. Mm -hmm. So they they got married um, really to to create this partnership, this yin yang um, that would that would build uh, Miles's vision, make it a reality. Well, here's a picture from a. Uh... It's one of the things they had to be doing back in the 30s, washing clothes. Mm -hmm. And Zilphia is on the um, second from the left, I think. Yes, and Miles is in the middle, just Miles smoking a pipe. Miles is working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nebraska is on the right. He was another one of the important founders. So yeah. This, this was kind of the state of affairs in the 1930s in Highlander. Yeah, and, and, you know, the work that they did to sort of support the school in terms of, like, making the food and washing the clothes and um you know maintaining the space was was part of the experience of bond it was part of the culture of the school where people could bond sort of outside of the the room where all the discussion was happening it's just another picture from uh, 
a young a young Zofia, I think. Mm -hmm. Lost in thought. <laughs> Talking to a union organizer who mm -hmm. would come by. So this is from this is a still from the film uh, People of the Cumberland, which was a propaganda film, a documentary um, that was released. Oh goodness. I should know the late thirties <laughs> <laughs> off the top of my head, but uh, but so this was this was sort of a it was a progressive film aimed at, at showing people outside of the region that there was labor important labor organizing going on in the south, and that um, organizations like Highlander were uh, were sort of important um, supporters of this progressive movement in the south that was that was empowering the impoverished so southerners and they used a lot of like fetishized poverty mm -hmm. <laughs> images very dramatic but it was very dramatic um and and it was a short film and but it was it was very successful and it was it was produced by the same organization that that uh produced waiting for lefty mm -hmm. or that uh that brought that out into the world um but it shows zilfia you know doing doing one of the many, many parts of her culture work, which in this case was handing out broadsides um, to, it looks like amalgamated clothing workers on their yeah. way out of a, a meeting. These textile workers up in La Follette. And so uh, one thing, uh, people worked at, would be at Highlander, but also the staff would go out and do a lot of field work. And so mm -hmm. this was her up in La Follette, but there are many pictures of that kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. So Kim, can you share a little, a little more about the cultural work, what she brought and, what she actually did and why you think it mattered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this, this picture because um, I think a lot of times people have this image that Zofia showed up after dinner and led the singing and that was it. Um, but she, there was so much more to it. Um, first of all, the accordion was, you know, she was a classical pianist, she was a tremendous pianist, uh, but she used the accordion because it was loud and, and you really had to sing out to sing over the accordion, the, the oh. accordion. So, um, so it really got people. You know, nobody wanted the accordion to be the star of the room. So it really got people uh, giving it their all. And and that was, you know, that sort of implicit, you know, empowering and motivating people to really throw them their full selves into it was kind of a ran through everything she did in the culture program. So there was this music program, there was a dramatics program where in the early days they were producing plays, like writing entire scripts and doing the set design and, and doing the costumes and they would perform them and invite the community and do these crazy productions. Um, so these are some of the pictures of some of the materials. Yeah. Um, that, so that's how they would do these mimeograph song sheets that they would share and then she would teach people to be song leaders, right? She, yeah, she would teach people to, to be song leaders and she would teach them that, you know, she was very emphatic about the fact that music is not trimming. It's not just something you do to entertain people, that, that it's an opportunity to communicate things that you can't communicate if, if you're uh, holding a sign or if you're having a debate. Um, music really gets into people's hearts. And so she really tried to impress upon people the importance of using music as a tool. And this is a song, We Shall Not Be Moved, mm -hmm. uh, that was in this set of song sheets. And then We Will Overcome, an earlier version before We Shall Overcome, was also in that, um, mm -hmm. in that song book. Do you want to say anything about the songs? Yeah, brought, uh, We Will Overcome came from the FTA CIO in 1946. Um, there's a, I could go on and on about that story, but, um, <laughs> that's, yeah. a whole nother, that's a whole other webinar. That's a whole other, yeah. Um, but yeah, she, she really liked these songs that, that, you know, there's, there's something, again, everything was implicit. There's something implicit in this song that you can't get past the first word without leaping over your assumptions and prejudices about everybody else in the room. We, it's not, we, who look like me or we who think like me or we <laughs> it's just we will overcome all of us if we can get together and get over our stuff you know um so she she used a lot of songs like like that we we shall not be moved we will overcome um there was there was sort of an implicit organizing and singing the song mm -hmm. and then this is a another song book that was put together yeah so in in 1939 she was uh sort of commissioned by the textile workers union um to create the songbook and she she followed the lead of Joe Hill in the the uh, little red songbook in terms of not putting 
the sheet music in there. She wanted to use melodies that people were already familiar with. So it was a lot of like to the tune of the battle hymn. Holly Wally do all over day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it would make it easier to, you know, you'd hand out so people would have the lyrics, but then somebody could call out, you know, page 36 to the tune of uh, My Country Tis of Thee. Um, so this was a really effective songbook and it had things like Solidarity Forever and and uh, Casey Jones and mm -hmm. and all these great uh, union songs. She wasn't creating new songs. She was just sort of compiling what people were already using as a way to connect textile workers in Louisiana with textile workers in Kentucky. With you know, it's the way to connect everybody into a bigger something bigger than themselves. The next images I think are all from sort of the drama work, the drama mm -hmm. production. Yeah. So you see here, there's a set. There's costumes. Um, there's some, there's some, uh, props and, uh, what's funny is that, you know, she, she really, she never did anything halfway, you know, she was really <laughs> wanted to, uh, to do everything in writ large, but over the first couple of years of this dramatics program, it, it really quickly metamorphosed into an improvisational program that, um, even Miles recognized was sort of a precursor to the role-playing curriculum. Um, they didn't have that phrase role playing back then, but it was an opportunity for people to dramatize what they were experiencing in their union and to to play the different parts. Um, and when you have somebody playing the boss and somebody playing the workers and somebody playing the cops, you know, you you start to people are reacting in real situations and they're starting to realize that everybody's doing the best they know how. So it sort of divorces them from this idea that it's it's about individuals and it's more about the systemic power structure that they that they're you know against um so it amplifies empathy and it, it you know it's a really powerful program that she i'm spitting all over the place <laughs> that's all right um it's just it, was, it was a really powerful program that that was that was really uh as core to the culture program yeah. at the time as, as was the music and this is a couple from a this uh publication that was five plays written about labor that were done often at the workshops, right? They would write, they would have people come workers and they would write a plays. Yeah. And they also for a brief time had the Highlander players that would go around to oh. local, <laughs> local union halls and perform these. But they, I also found a letter that she would send along with scripts telling people, here's some plays that, that people came up with at Highlander. We encourage you to produce them. You don't have, you don't have to have a stage or a, or costumes or anything, you can just you know mm -hmm. do your version of it, and it, you'll still get the good, the same good stuff out of it. And here on the right is the Lollipop Papa, which was her musical that she wrote. Uh, that that's kind of ridiculous, but also <laughs> fantastic. So they also mimeograph these off. So many of you probably have never seen a mimeograph before, but it was a lot of work to even just like do a mimeograph. So they would do that so they could have multiple copies and get them out to union locals. And mm -hmm. so these are some of the. And then this was another play, Gumbo, written in Miss, about Mississippi, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, for people that might want to learn more, there's also some really amazing extensive workshop reports where people, the students, would put together reports and talk about what they did. And this is one from 1939, the winter term. And they would stay for a pretty long time. So, mm -hmm. so it lists who was there, what unions they were from all the things they did and so they're they're really fun to read because you're trying to picture all these people up on this mountain coming mm -hmm. from all over doing these amazing things and going back and fighting the bosses yeah and, and a lot of these are really valuable in my research just in terms of you know get understanding highlander was a really weird place uh and it was a weird experience for a lot of these people so it was a you know a way for them to sort of um process what they were going through at the same time as reporting about it um, so another thing that we that we've talked about in this in your book is some about a lot of what Zilfia did in terms of welcoming people, building relationships in the local community, making people people feel at home, which I think is an undertold story about mm -hmm. sort of how this educational process works. And so this is a picture from they did a lot of silly games at Highlander, mm -hmm. and Zilfia's right there playing them. But if you could say a little more about kind of her role there, because I think that is something that you've captured really amazingly. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like I said, Highlander was was sort of a strange place for somebody to roll up on. And, you know, they were really trying to get at transformational change. And so six weeks seems like a long time, but in the course of somebody's life, it's really not 
a lot of time to trans to transform. <laughs> so it really started from the minute they got out of the car and Zilfi would welcome them. And it wasn't like, let me give you a tour of the school. It was like, welcome to my home. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. And she had this, uh, this, she was like the mama bear. Um, you know, you hear a lot from the people that were around at that time that, you know, Miles would take you apart and Zilfia would put you back together. <laughs> um, so she did that, you know, just sort of through who she was, but there was also all these games, you know, they played sardines and they played horseshoes, they played softball and volleyball. Um, they measured each other's smiles, anything to get <laughs> people, you know, close to each other and laughing and relaxing. And it was part of it was having fun and unwinding and blowing off steam, but you were also making connections and, and creating relationships that would serve you after you got back home. Can you say a little more about the dynamic of being in that community and what she did to build relationships and stuff? Because I think that's an amazing story about Highlander being in the middle of this rural, very rural community and that being there so long with a lot of support actually from many people in the community mm -hmm. um, and also fighting many other people being very nervous about Highlander, so. Yeah, and, and that was the really important part is that, you know, a lot of people were really nervous about Highlander, um, partly because there were a lot of outsiders, a lot of Northeasterners, people from Chicago and New York, um, Antioch College, you know. Um, so Zilfia, she, she really understood the value of friendship and outreach, and, and it wasn't, uh, the outreach that she did wasn't as much of a propaganda piece as it was just trying to generate you know, genuine friendships. And she, um, she employed people who came and helped her with the children. Um, and she welcomed people over for dinner. She was an incredible cook. Um, and she, there was a, there was a newsletter that went out at the local newspaper that went out in the community. And she wrote for that a lot. Mm -hmm. Every time she traveled, she would report on her travels and she went to Guatemala she did this sort of ethnography to, <laughs> and it was all sort of in the, in the service of like, look, there's an outside world and outsiders are not so weird and different from mm -hmm. you. Um, so, I mean, really everything she did, did was in service of making connections and, and creating sort of a collaborative community spirit. And, you know, there were some people who thought after she died and nobody was really focused on maintaining those relationships that that was sort of when mm -hmm. people started to, fracture. So this is a picture showing a great spirit of her at a CIO convention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she would do these, uh, these uh, sort of lectures, and they weren't really lectures, but she would lead the singing. And then in between, she would talk to people about um, what the songs were saying. And so and then she would have them sing them again, once they really thought mm -hmm. about what it means to say we shall overcome or we mm -hmm. shall not be moved. Um, so you can see a lot of these people, you know, really singing with a lot of spirit and that tradition of telling the story with the song i think has been true for many cultural workers guy and candy to farah mm -hmm. wendy o'neill bernice johnson reagan that the story about the song is as important as the song mm -hmm. in terms of helping convey something that is helpful for people to know and give people spirit yeah and she did that in the songbooks too that there was a songbook that she had where she would collect stories from the people that sent her the songs so that people you know, could have that context when, when they were sharing the songs and Candy and Guy did that as well in, in their songbooks. And this is a picture of a staff meeting at Highlander um, <laughs> in the old library. And then just as I think this beautiful picture of her, of her, I think it was at Joey and Will and Ama Willamette's wedding. But mm -hmm. just, I thought if you want to say anything else you'd like to share about Zilfia having come to know her so well. No, I could, I could go on for 446 pages. <laughs> well, luckily, that, luckily we'll mention it. That will be in a year. Everyone will get the truth, the complete truth revealed. But yeah. <laughs> she was just, uh, you know, I, I think that, that um, what she conveyed to people about the importance of the using music in the arts um, was more important than anything she ever told people about the importance mm -hmm. of, you know, it was like she communicated this spirit, this energy within the music that made such an impression that people took it back with them. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, um, the most important part of our work is the stuff that you can't even explain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just sort of the spirit she brought yeah. into the room. I think of her as sort of helping people move with their hearts and not just their heads and Miles sort of helping people move with their heads. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, somebody said, 
he was the brain of Highlander and she was the heart. <laughs> Although there were many other people too. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, for sure. So uh, that tells you a little bit about this amazing woman. Um, we wanted to just make sure that everyone knows that in a year, you will have to wait, but with anxious anticipation, the book coming from the University of Texas Press that Kim has written called A Singing Army, The Life and Times of Zilphia Horton. And actually that comes from a quote that's in the songbook from John Lewis. Mm -hmm. What well, was a singing army as a winning army? Mm -hmm. um, so Kim does have a, has, a, has a site and you can follow her and some more about the book if you you'll need to know some more before the book comes out. Uh, we wanted to just share some of the places where these materials are. And part of what we want to be doing is sharing more of these materials, telling these stories. These pictures came from Highlander, the, re, the archive there. The Wisconsin Historical Society has an amazing Highlander collection and a lot of the, the plays and song sheets, many of them came from there. And I'm put in the UNC Southern Folklife Collection because they also have uh, digitized songs from old recordings that you can listen to on their website. Um, and so if you want to kind of hear some of the singing, that's kind of a cool place to go. And you can just look at the Highlander collection. So just to say there's an amazing history about Highlander that's kind of gathered all over the place. And we're trying to figure out ways to kind of share the story a little more. So we hope that you will be fascinated by uh, Zofia Horton as we are. And thank him for all this work to learn all about this woman who passed away over 50 years ago. 60 years ago, I guess. 60 yeah, 1956. Um, and so the last thing we just want to mention is that we are uh, needing help to help share more movement histories. We have a campaign to raise funds for our new learning center and also for our programming. And uh, if you would like to help make a donation or learn more, we have this site and we can uh, share more information with you through the website and happy to hear from you if you'd like to help support this work in the future. You can also go onto the Highlander website and get on our View from the Hill and also on Facebook if you want to kind of know more about ongoing work that we're doing. So thank you all. Thanks, Kim. It's thank great you. having you here to talk about Zofia. And I'm so happy to know more about her myself. <laughs> all right. Great. We're done. <laughs>